Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that not one dash of your foot will go against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited upon him. Will God add blessings to the reading of his word today? Would you all pray with me, please? Loving God, in this hour and in this place, I ask that you grant to me the gift of preaching, that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth bring glory to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And to the beloved who are gathered here today, I ask that you grant them the gift of hearing. May our time together be one in which we truly open ourselves to you hearing what your words have to say as they prepare us in this Lenten season to embrace not only the entry of your Son, but also his death and the power of his resurrection. It is his name I pray. Amen. Most of the time in my life, and without any real thought, I end up doing what I do and make decisions that, shall we say, lack in wisdom. Basically, I do things and I sin. In these moments, I will tend to trivialize what I've done, rationalizing as a mere error in judgment, or blame it on some circumstance that I'm feeling at that moment. I was hungry. I was tired, I was lonely, I was desperate. But when I read this passage out of Matthew, and I see what and whom Jesus faced, I am reminded that in all circumstances of life, sin is a flawed approach to decision-making that leads us to making worse decisions with which we can be comfortable. If I simply ignore this passage, then I become accustomed to making Choices that are not glorifying God. I make choices that allow to rationalize what I've done away. And in time, I become accustomed to choosing what is easiest in life, rather than deciding to stop and rely on my faith. You see, if we're not in the habit of it, it doesn't occur to us to even do it. It's always possible to be true to a higher calling. But this passage, when it takes place, Jesus has just been baptized in the waters of the Jordan. The voice from the heavens proclaims, You are my child, my beloved, in you I am well pleased. And then Jesus goes into the middle of nowhere to decide what kind of child he's going to be. There was this mass assumption, and it's naive at best, that Jesus automatically knew who and what he was supposed to be. Because he was the son of God. Well, if we knew, if he had inclinations of that divinity, don't you think we would have had earlier stories about him in his divinity when he was growing up? This was his wake-up call. This was the point where he chose. Was he going to be the son of Joseph or the son of God? We don't think about that very often. He went into the wilderness to choose 
what child he was going to be. The wilderness is hot and barren. The hills are dust just heaped up upon each other. The rocks are jagged. The wind howls at night. Jesus may have been weighed down with the burden of choosing the direction for his life that he doesn't even think of food. He's making a decision that will not only change his life, but will have a global impact for generations to come. Have any of us ever been faced with a decision like that? Food wasn't a thought. It is in those days, maybe in those weeks since he's eaten. And I think it's a great understatement when Matthew writes, he was hungry. He hungered. He was famished. The silence in all of this is suddenly broken somewhere, and there's a voice, maybe a whisper, maybe a screaming whisper. If you are God's child, command this stone so it becomes bread. Jesus remembers, I think, John. I think he remembers the River Jordan. I think he remembers the heavens opening up and the, sky, and the voice from heaven saying, You are my child, the beloved. But that's not the voice he hears. It's a voice of questioning what he's doing. It's a voice of temptation. It's not saying you are the child of God. It's saying, if you are the child of God. In this moment, while Jesus is struggling with his identity, he's also being the first person ever tempted with fast food. Come on, that's a joke. You can laugh at it. Up until this time, food took hours to make. There's a rock. Will it? Snap your fingers. Loaf of bread. Pumpernickel rye. A tortilla, flatbread, whatever you want it to be. Hey, you can even invent potato chips, even though no one will know what they are yet. Come on, Jesus. You're hungry. Your body needs food. Who's it going to hurt? If you are God's child, then why shouldn't you have what you want? Now, I don't know about you all, but I struggle with the attraction of doing what's easy. Um, the first temptation is usually to make decisions that are easiest for me because uh, it requires the least amount of effort. I will often pass on what is eternally best for myself and take what is satisfying in that moment because I can get back to doing the things that I want to do, which is reading a good book. When the weather's nice, sitting outside under my patio and watching the clouds go by. It is not picking up after the dog, making sure my wife is taken care of, and preparing for Sunday morning sermon. The temptation is to be leisure, relaxed. As believers, we are tempted to choose the easy way when we realize how hard it is to actually forgive someone. How hard it is to listen to someone who is lonely and all they're doing is whining. How hard it is to share what we have with the poor. How hard it is to appreciate someone who really thinks and acts in a way that we are fundamentally opposed to. It's hard to open ourselves to new possibilities, new ways of growing in our understanding of being children of God, new ways to participate in the activities of the body of Christ when we've held on to practices, teachings, and preferences that we have known our entire life. It is much easier to settle for a tepid form of faith that is predictable rather than put an effort forward into breaking the mold and trusting God. We get so used to choosing what's easiest that we seldom consider a way to sacrifice or the pains that come along with growing. I find that for myself, I like to believe in the easy things that if I'm doing well, if I'm providing well for my family, then obviously God approves because I'm comfortable, my wife and son are comfortable, the dog is comfortable, then I believe we're doing what we should be doing. That's not always 
the case. In fact, I think if we look at it and say, look at how comfortable I am, God must be blessing me, I think we're missing the point in the boat entirely. Jesus understands the temptation of the easy way, the way of luxury, the dream of avarice. But he responds by saying, yes, I have the power to do this, but one cannot live by bread alone. His obedience to God is more important than his own personal comfort and care. So the Satan tries again, like a con man with an arm covered with a bunch of fake Rolex watches. And this time it's from the steeple of the old temple in town. If you are God's son, throw yourself down. You know what the Bible says. God won't let you get hurt. Not a hair on your head will be crushed. This is a particularly powerful image to the Jews of the first century who heard this reading of Matthew the first time. And Matthew, out of all four Gospels, is the most Jewish written. Its Greek grammar emulates Jewish grammar, which means instead of the verb being in the middle of the sentence, half the time it's at the end. Hard to translate. Anyway, the imagery here is that the first century... Jews believe that when Messiah came, he would reveal himself from the temple roof, the center of the Jews' life, culture, and worship, the place where they came to interact with God. They did not necessarily believe that God was in all places and all times. That's a very New Testament concept. Um, the Jews at this time believed that you could be taught Torah, and you could offer prayers, and you could go to temple and be in community. But if you really wanted God to hear you, to give you approval, to receive blessing, you had to make the trip from wherever you lived in the world and go to the temple of Jerusalem because there in the holies of holies is where God came to be on earth, not everywhere else throughout creation. So if there's a place that Messiah is going to reveal himself, it's going to be the place that God resides, the temple. The Satan. And Satan, Hebrew, Satan, means the adversary. The adversary is reminding Jesus that he can be the Messiah that the people want, fulfilling the expectation, that first century idea, of appearing on that rooftop before the great multitude of people. He could be a great religious teacher and skip all the hard parts of the ministry that awaits him that the prophecies have talked about, of where he's going to be mocked, of where he's going to be ridiculed, of where his very identity and paternity and need for being here is going to be questioned. He will be rejected. He will be tortured. He will be crucified. Jesus could have modified his ministry very easily in that moment if he just chose to be what the people wanted instead of what God was calling him to be. The task that God had put before him. When we are offered option number two, what's behind the door that we can't see, there is the temptation, it's a temptation for us to look like we're spiritual people. We can keep up the appearances even though we have lowered our expectations of growing in our faith and being part of a body of God. In T.S. Eliot's play, Murder in the Cathedral, the Satan comes to Thomas Beckett and offers the temptation of being a martyr, a religious hero. But Beckett understands the last temptation is the greatest treason he will ever face. He could go ahead and do the right thing and make a wrong decision. We've figured out that we can look religious, that we can look holy without truly seeking God. We as a people have figured out that we can do good things without serving God. We can inquire about how a person is doing without caring. It's easy to meet people's religious expectations when we know how to pretend that we are living as God's children. That's when that screaming whisper returns with an offer of palaces and kingdoms in Jesus' ear. See all of this of the world from the mountaintop? Compromise. Give in to me just a little bit. And everything that you see, all of it will be yours. 
total and complete power and control over all life in this world. All Jesus has to do is stop and bow down and worship the Satan and choose our world's concept of success. This third temptation is what our world tells us we want. Power and success. So we don't have to deal with the morons and nitwits that bother us to no end. Because we can put up walls around us that keep you out, but keep me in. Being all-powerful means not having to deal with suffering and pain, because we are on top and everyone and everything else is beneath us. But the evil one doesn't always appear to us in such an easy, identifiable pattern, form, shape. We have pictures of a person in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork, but the Satan does not always look like that. The tempter appears as reasonableness, rationality, and circumstantial-based excuses. Evil is a nagging voice, and it's a desire for a little bigger house, a little more in our savings account, a little better job. Have you ever learned that someone where you work in the same job, the same position that you have, makes just a little bit more money than you do? It doesn't do any of us any good to think about it, does no good to obsess about it, but for some reason, we do. The weakness of our egos keeps us thinking about what an injustice of it all that it is. And if we had just a little bit of that extra money, and the longer, you know, we could do some better things with it, the longer we live a life that chooses to hold on to those selfish need of greed, it eventually crowds out the things that really matter for our heart, mind, and soul, like trusting God in every step with every breath. The theologian O.A. Batista wrote, if you have reached the pinnacle of success, as soon as you, you know that you have reached the pinnacle of success, as soon as you become uninterested in money, compliments, or publicity. By that standard, most of us still have some distance to go from the summit, and I'll put myself at the front of the line. Through cracked and bleeding lips, Jesus answers this master counterfeiter, bow down to God alone and worship only God. And in that moment, the adversary retreats until another time. Jesus in his ministry never stops being tempted. This is the only time that we see Satan doing it face-to-face, one-on-one. But in every little skirmish, every little question, every little point of doubt that has confronted Jesus, that is the Satan creeping up, casting doubt, questioning, who will you choose? Let me tempt you with the easy way out. Jesus faced the same temptations to compromise that we face. Surviving through another day, caring for those in our care, loving those who are unloved, making sure that we are true to the God who created us and sends us into this world to minister in his name. We can choose every day between what seems okay and what is true and live out the power of the gospel. We need to remember this story in the wilderness, especially in this Lenten season. There were no witnesses to what Jesus did in that wilderness. I personally believe that he may have told the disciples because he hoped that they would remember and pass the power onto that story to others who had the ears to hear. If you have ever experienced someone who is so kind and caring, did they inspire you to be more kind and caring in your life? That's the power of sharing the story of Jesus the power of sharing the story of the Gospels. Same thing, passing it on to someone else. I know that I have, which is a big reason why I went into the Gospel ministry. I know that that is why I am here today. The wrestling match that I have done with 
my Lord, my own self, figuring out who I am both as a child of God, a son, a husband, a dad, a pastor, and everything in between. I wrestle with the temptations. I wrestle with being comfortable, having my ego stroked, wanting to have a life of affluence versus being happy and content with God has given me where I am and what I'm doing. It is a wrestling match and it is a temptation. But this story out of the wilderness, Jesus' wrestling match with the Satan, it reminds me that who I am and to whom I belong. I'm sorry, I'm not yours. And if my wife were here, I would say, I'm sorry, I'm not yours. And I'd look at my hood of a son and go, I'm definitely not yours. I belong to the God Almighty. Which, when I look in the mirror, I think God's really good looking. Beard and all. Because I can hear his voice saying, you are my child, and I love you. I can hear it when I'm putting him first. I can hear him when I'm turning over my temptations and saying, I really don't have a bloody clue what to do. Quiet, calm, listen. God has given us an assurance that we, his children, will have him with us. We come to this Lenten season, this first Sunday of Lent, in a time that we can repent and confess our longing for paths of less resistance, putting those aside and saying, God, in our journey this Lenten season, give us new, give us honest hearts to glorify you. It's really that simple and that difficult at the same time. But if we do like our Savior did, turn to what we know, our understanding of the scriptures, the power and reliance of his spirit among us, and his angels will be there to take care of us every time he carries us through each challenge. Would you all pray with me, please? There are so many distractions in this world, O oh God, that can make us farther and farther away from you. But you created us to be one with you. You created our hearts to receive your love and your power. And we wrestle with being close to you versus the dreams of our egos. Help us to take the things that we know that we've come accustomed to and align them with you. Help us to spend these days of Lent wrestling with, asking questions, and seeing the beauty and power of your love in our lives each and every day in how you are calling us to grow, how you are calling us to mature in our faith, and how, O oh God, when we celebrate the resurrection of your Son, how you're calling us to apply it to our lives. We ask this in your Son's precious and most holy name. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our concluding hymn for today is number 561. Just a closer walk with thee. I was talking to a friend of mine this past week who their second home is New Orleans, and they said, oh, you did that in honor of Mardi Gras. I said, no, I did it because I liked the hymn. So uh, let us stand and let us sing and let us continue to worship. Just a closer walk with thee Granted Jesus is my plea Daily walking close to thee Let it be, dear Lord, let it be I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as 
as I walk, but let me walk with Thee. Just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. A lot of times we sit there and look at the temptations in front of us and are just simply overwhelmed. All we have to do is remember that our God is with us, that our God loves us. And when in doubt and not sure what to do, take a breath, take a step back, ask for a little help. In that place, God will grant us grace, will grant us wisdom, will fill our hearts with peace. And in our interaction and reliance on him, we are very simply living his love and are serving him as a witness to his son's gift. That's how we disable temptations. Excuse me. That's how God disables temptations through us. Let's, let me be clear on that. As you go from this place today, take what you've heard Think about it, pray about it, wrestle with it, and the Lenten season is basically a few weeks of wrestling with our faith in our Creator, so I encourage you to do that. But as you do all that, as you go into this world, let the people you encounter know that y'all are children of God. Go in grace, be filled with His peace. Amen.